When life throws you a challenge, where does your strength come from? Today I want to share with you how to have a strong life, to have perspective and power that carries you through the storms, and a foundation of wisdom that will give you a life direction, fruitfulness, and peace. Then, after the message, join me for a conversation with my son Andy as we tackle some very practical questions about prayer and talk about how to have a daily enriching conversation with God. Next on In Touch, A Strong Life. You can have a strong body and have a weak life. You can have a strong life, have a weak body, or you can have a strong life and a strong body. All of us know what constitutes a strong body, but what constitutes a strong life? And that's what I want to talk about in this message. As we said, we've had three in this series of church and, and uh, family, and now the whole idea of a strong life. What is a strong life? So I want you to turn to a very familiar passage that just perfectly describes what we're talking about, and that's the seventh chapter of Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount. And in the beginning in the 24th verse, and how many times have you read this? And so I want us to look at this in light of a strong life. And so Jesus said in verse 24, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against the house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been, been built and founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rains fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and slammed against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. When Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teachings, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. When I look in the scriptures and I think about all the verses in the Bible that talk about life and so forth, here's a perfect picture of a weak life and a strong life. And remember this, every one of us is still building our life, whether you're 16 or 7 to 6, you're still building your life. And what we are on the inside makes all the difference in the world. And I think many people at first may fool you by the lifestyle they look like, but then when the storms hit them, when reality breaks in, when there's difficulty, hardship, pain, suffering, death, loss, all kinds of hardship that comes their way, the people who have built their life on the foundation have a strong life if they built it on the right foundation. People who look like they could do the same thing, but when those storms come, they don't have the same results. So you can't look and see and tell how strong a person is or how weak they may be. What happens to them when the storms of life come, and they're coming to all of us. All kinds of difficulty, hardship and pain and loss and bereavement, that it comes to all of us. And the issue is, how do we respond? In Palestine, for example, uh, they would have those torrential storms, and uh, as a result, those uh, gullies that we would call a gully would fill up with water, and before long it was a torrential flood. And anything that was weak, would fall. The same thing is true in our life. When difficulty, hardship, and pain, and suffering, and disappointment come our way, if our life is strong, we can stand it. If it's not, we won't. And this is what drives some people, for example, to alcohol, or drugs, or immorality, or whatever it might be. They look strong until the storms of life come. Then they got to find something that would they think satisfy them or strengthen them or help them or encouragement. There's only one thing that does that. And what this whole message is about and what, what this passage of Scripture is about when Jesus speaks here, he's speaking of two lives, a weak life and a strong life. 
If someone had to look at your life and try to figure out which is true of you, do you have a strong life or a weak life, what would they consider? And if they look at you, they may say, well, he's got to be, he's got to have a strong life. She, she must have a strong life. But what would they say when these difficulties and hardships and trials and tribulations come? How you respond in those days, that's how we judge whether our life is strong or whether it's weak. So what I want to do in this message is simply this. Describe a strong life. We know what a weak life is. What's a strong life about? And how does our life become strong? There's not a question of whether you'll face trials and storms or not. They are coming, and they will reveal who we are and what we are like and what our foundation is built on. And you as a parent need to think about this. You're building into your children either a firm foundation that'll make it possible for them to face any and all the situations in life that are coming, or you may neglect that part of your discipline in life for them, and they come along and they get blown off the foundation, whatever foundation they had to begin with. And oftentimes parents say, well, I can't figure, I, can't, I just can't believe you're acting like this. It just may be that you never built a foundation in them that would show them how to face when a torrent of temptation comes their way, when a storm of trial comes their way and disappointment and heartache, when there's loss in their life, how do you respond? If you don't have a strong life, you don't respond correctly. And oftentimes, when that storm comes, instead of standing strong and building you stronger, what happens? Simply this, you cave in. And oftentimes, a person will ruin and wreck their life. So I want us to think about these characteristics. And if you're wise, you'll jot these down. They'll all be on the screen. And I want to encourage you to do this. Not only to jot them down, but listen, be strong enough, courageous enough, if that's what it takes, for you to write them down and take them home and, and put them on the table beside your bed. And tonight, before you go to bed, just read over them and ask yourself the question. Well, Lord, number one, uh, in this area, is this, does, in my life, am I strong here? Am I strong here? Oops, uh-oh, I don't have to ask you about that one, Lord. What about this and what about that? In other words, take a little survey. Somebody says, well, I don't need to do that. No, you don't need to. But you'll be wise if you do, because watch this. You only know how strong you are when you find out what your weaknesses are. If you don't know what your weaknesses are, the devil will trip you up for sure. Somebody says, well, I can never be tempted by that. That wouldn't ever come my way. You've set yourself up for an attack because Satan would not, he's not going to ignore that boast. So I want you to listen carefully. And um, I want you to think when I mention each one of these, uh, where does it fit in my life? So let's begin. The first one is simply this, and that is a strong life has placed their trust in Jesus Christ as their personal savior. That is, a strong life begins with a personal relationship with Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord of their life. That's first, that's foremost. You can't put that any other place except on the bottom. That's the foundation, that you've trusted Jesus. And that, that is, you can look back in your life and know at a particular time. You may not be able to name the day or the week or even the month, but you know, or may, maybe even the year, but you know at a certain time, you remember that you gave your life to Christ and that you know that you're saved. That's foundation. Evidence that you have a strong life. Secondly, and that's this, that you are guided by the Holy Spirit. A person who has a strong life is guided by the Holy Spirit. When Jesus saved you, he sent the Holy Spirit into your life to indwell you. Why did he send him? He sent him for the simple reason that you and I, he knew, could not live adequately apart from him. This is why he said to his disciples, before you launch out on fulfilling the Great Commission, you're not ready yet. You're not ready until the Holy Spirit fills you and enables you and empowers you to do what I called you to do. The truth is, every strong life is a life that has the indwelling Holy Spirit and has him there for God's purpose, that is to guide us and to lead us. We can't look around and read the paper or listen to what, or watch the television and find out how to make decisions. We find out how to make decisions by coming to God, asking Him and the Holy Spirit 
who lives within every single believer will guide you. He will enable you. He will show you the paths you should take and decisions you have to make in life. He'll show you which ones are the wisest decisions. A wise person will listen to the promptings of the Holy Spirit in your life. And that's why when the Spirit of God speaks, you can't say, oh, it's just my feeling. Oh, you know what? I'm not going. God speaks clearly, not audibly, but He speaks very clearly and oftentimes stronger than audibly because He will impress your heart, your life, your mind, your attention to one particular area of life that you're dealing with. He's trying to say something to you. A, a strong life listens to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Thirdly, a strong life has this priority in their life, and that is spending time alone with prayer, in prayer with God. Spending time alone with God in prayer is the, listen, this is the connecting point you have with God. You look all around you. You can read and this, that, and other, and so forth, but your connection point with Him is the time you spend with Him in prayer. And people say, well, you know what? I just found myself too busy to pray. No, it's just the miss, listen, it's a misalignment of what's important in your life. The most important thing in your life is your relationship to Him, your connection to Almighty God. He's the one you talk to. He's the one you, you, you bring your needs to. A strong person has a strong prayer life. I've never, I've never met a strong person, really, that did not have a strong prayer life. You can get by with some little praying here and there, but you know what? That doesn't make you strong. A strong life has a communication with God. You know how to talk to Him. You know how to listen to Him. You know how to bring your needs and hurts and joys and peace and, and everything else to Him. And that is an absolute primary of your life. In fact, if you think about teaching your children in life, if you don't teach them early in life by example first and by your praying with your children, you listen, watch this, you have cheated them. You have denied them. Listen, you have, you have hurt them in more ways than you will ever know. They're going to grow up thinking they've got to figure it all out. They've got to depend on you for everything. No, they should grow up believing in their heart that Almighty God is their God. They know what prayer is. They know who God is. And teaching them to spend time in prayer with God every day. There's not a single one of us who is too busy to pray. Now, if you tell God you're too busy to pray, here's what He may do. He may just lay you out with something that puts you in the hospital for about two weeks, flat on your back, and then all you've got to do is pray. <laughs> and so sometimes we bring things on ourselves. Well, Lord, I just would if I, if I had time. He will give you time. The truth is you have time. <laughs> and the time you have is the time He's given you. It's a matter of your choosing how you spend your time. Listen, you can't, in, it's not spending. You can't invest your time in any way that's stronger, makes you stronger than praying and talking to Him as a daily, listen, it's not just a habit, it is a habit, it's a daily discipline in your life. He is first above everything else. Very important for strong life. <laughs> then of course, a strong life is built upon the teachings of the Word of God, and listen, and the application of them. It's one thing to hear it, but applying it is something else. So when you come on Sunday morning, you take notes, for example, what do you do with them? It's application. And I think about how many people go to church week after week and month after years and years and years. They never carry a Bible. They never take a note. They couldn't tell you anything the pastor said. And, and, they, and years and years and years later, they can't tell you anything. Why? Because they heard it, but they didn't apply it. We have to apply it. Think of all the sounds that you get in any given day whether it's television, radio, traffic, people talking, whatever it might be. The sound, of the, the sound of the Word of God and the sound of the voice of God is the most important sound. And you and I cannot do anything any more important than feeding upon the Word of God. That's, uh, for example, you show me a strong life and I'll tell you somebody, if you keep talking to them a little while, they'll bring up some scripture that God's laid on their heart. And all of us who have been through difficulty and trial, we've got scriptures. Scriptures that God placed upon our heart to take us through difficult times. If you don't read the Bible, you don't have one. You'll say, well, there's some verse in the Bible somewhere. It goes something like this. Um, you know what? That won't work. And somebody will say once in a while, why do you keep, why do you keep holding that Bible up? Because that's what this is all about. 
This isn't about my opinion. This is about what holy God who created us and has a will and purpose and plan for our life, who will be there when we die, who will call us to judgment. This is all about Him and all about His relationship to us and our place in life. That's why we hold the Bible up. And that's why we hold it up because we'd like to see everybody carrying the Bible to church. You go to church to be instructed in the Word of God, not just to go to church to sell your conscience. And, but that's exactly what some people do. Consistently, listen, a person who has a strong life consistently obeys God as a habit and attempts and tries to leave all the consequences to Him. Sometimes we don't. That's why I said try. If you have the habit of your life obeying God, for example, think about this. As a follower of Jesus Christ, to disobey God should be an, ex should be an exception in your life. To obey Him should be the norm for your life. Why? Because that's who we are. And a strong life is a life that is built on obeying the truth of the Word of God. Then, of course, one of the, th one of the areas of a strong life is that we see the Lord Jesus Christ as the strength of our life. Now think about this for a moment. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. He's in jail, beaten, chained, locked up, you name it. And you know what? His foundation was so solid that no matter what they did, they never discouraged him. Uh, they never made him quit. They tried their best to stop him from att attempted assassinations to everything else. They didn't. Why? Because he was strong. He was strong in the Word of God. He was strong in his relationship to God. He was strong in his obedience to God. And he knew in his heart that the strength of his life was not in his body, but was in his relationship to Jesus Christ. That's where our strength lies, in relationship. And all these other things are part of that relationship. So ask yourself the question, how strong is your life? How, how, how much of your life, for example, you get up in the morning and say, well, I'm going to do this, that, and the other. How often do you get up to say, Father, I want to thank you that you are my strength today. And if you have a job that's very difficult, do you ever say to him, Lord, I need, I need your strength today to get this done. I don't even know how I'm, how I'm going to be able to do what I'm supposed to do. You're my strength. And what you've done is you, you have invited the Lord God into your life, so to speak, through His Holy Spirit to enable you and strengthen you and encourage you. And don't, it does not let you quit. Because with Him, you can accomplish anything God has set before you to accomplish. Then, of course, you've got to live a disciplined life. A disciplined life is a part of a strong life. Because if a person's disciplined, uh, they're not disciplined in just one area. If you live a disciplined life, you're careful about what you eat. You're careful about exercise. You're careful about how you spend your time. You're careful about how you spend your money. And, and we talk, we'll talk about that in a second. In other words, uh, you, if, if you live a disciplined life, you're in control of your life. I don't mean in control in a bad way. I mean, for example, uh, you have goals and you have uh, direction for your life. If you live a disciplined life, there's some things you don't do. And if you decide to live a godly life, You've made that a decision in your life, and you've stood here week after week after week, and you've said, you've sung this song, I surrender all. If you've done that, and Jesus Christ is the Lord and Master of life, you're building strength. And I believe if you come to church week after week, you take notes, you apply them to your heart, you're building strength. God is building strength into your life, building truth into your life. And building a sense of discipline. Listen, a disciplined life doesn't say, oh, I just don't think I'm not going to work today. Or a disciplined life equally doesn't say, I'm not going to read the Bible and pray today. I'm just, going to take, I'm just going to do what I want to do today. A disciplined life isn't something that happens once in a while. It is a daily constraint in our life that is a constraint that God gives us for, for our own good. And that's what we try to teach our children. We teach them to live a disciplined life so you don't have to discipline. You want them to do certain things, to get up a certain time, put on their clothes, look their best, and so forth. So ask yourself the question, is, uh, would you consider your life a disciplined life? You're in control. Or do you just sort of come, you just sort of go with the wind, just uh, whatever comes your way. A disciplined life is a strong life, and it's necessary. Then, of course... I think about the direction for our life. 
What's the direction? Where are you headed? What, what are you trying to accomplish in life? I think about how many people get up and say, well, I've got to go to work this morning, work eight hours, and thank God I'll be off at four or five o'clock. Or how many people say, and I've had them to say to me, uh, maybe purchasing something and somebody will say, I'll say, how are you doing? I always get a little conversation going, well, I'm doing fine. Thank God it's Friday. Thank God it's Friday. Let me ask you a question. Are you living to work eight hours a day to get paid so at the end of the week you can get paid or next week you get paid? Are you living your life in order to live till you get 62 or 65 so you can finally retire and, as you said, do what I want to do or do nothing? You tell your body I'm going to do nothing, your body responds. Because God never built a single one of us to ever reach any age where we don't do anything. He intends for us to be useful, and as the Bible says, it's fruitful in old age. Every day of our life, every day of your life is a gift from God. It's not to be wasted and to say, well, I'm not going to do anything today. You can speak, you can walk, you can handle things, you can help. Many things you and I can do until the last day of our life. You and I should be serving Him in some fashion, even if it's just talking to someone else. And somebody says, well, but suppose I'm on the, in the hospital in the bed and I don't have but five days to live. You can talk to a lot of nurses in five days. You can talk to a lot of other people in the hospital who are dying and sick and you name it. But you're not in the hospital. You're well. At what point in your life do you have the right to tell God, this is it, no more work, going to enjoy life? If you have a strong life, here's what you're going to find. The more time you have, listen, the more you want to serve God and the stronger you're going to get. Very important we see our life from God's viewpoint, from His viewpoint, not our own. Then, um, what about these storms of life? Because a, a strong person, listen, a strong person can withstand the storms and learn from them. Now, most people, when a big storm comes in their life, difficulty, hardship, pain, whatever it might be, they want to ask God, well, why have you allowed this? Why, God, if you love me, why do you allow this to happen? Why have you taken my loved one? Why is my child sick? Why have I lost my job? Why have I not lost my money? And God, what, why have you done all this to me? Well, you remember what we said about those two houses? Both of them look alike. You can't tell which is the strong one without the storm. The storms in our life, God allows them. They may come through your enemy. They come through somebody else. No matter what, they come in order to do what? In order to build godly strength within us. He allows them to build strength. Why was Paul such an awesome servant of God? Why didn't God say, well, Paul, you're so faithful and loyal and devoted to me, writing all these epistles. Uh, you shouldn't be in jail. You shouldn't be tried. You shouldn't. All these things that happened to him, persecuted, almost assassinated. Uh, why, why, did, why, did, why did God allow that in his life? I'll tell you why. There would be no, there would be no Romans and no Corinthians and no Ephesians and Galatians and Colossians and all these books he wrote in prison. It was difficulty, hardship, and pain that he learned the awesome lessons. Why does God send these into our life or allow them to happen? He, he, never, he never said it would be an easy life. Some people's life seems to be easier than others. At my age, I can tell you this. I wouldn't change a pain, a heartache, a trial, a tribulation, a hurt, a disappointment, tears. I wouldn't change any of that for what God has taught me under any condition. And God's, God allows these things in our life. We may see them as enemies, and it may be our enemy, or it may be somebody that breaks our heart, whatever it might be. But what's God up to? He's allowing them, why? To build inner strength into your life. Storms are coming. And the question is, can you handle them? Are you ready for them? If you haven't got the right foundation, if you don't have a strong life, you, you, you don't respond in the right way. And you find yourself giving up and quitting, or being tempted to go to some other alternative, whether it's some drug or some uh, a form of immorality or something to drink or whatever it might be, adjoining something, and uh, to, to get the pain out. Listen, God's purpose is not to get the pain out, but to get the strength on the inside of you to build you to be a godly person so that you can accomplish His purpose for your life. You say, I don't know what His purpose is. He's more than willing to show you. 
He's more than willing to help you. Somebody says, well, I'm 60 years old. What purpose has God got in my life? Well, let me say two things. You're asking a little late, but He still has a purpose for your life. And He'll take you wherever, listen to this, He'll take you wherever you are willing to give yourself to Him, and from that point on, He'll use you and work in your life to accomplish His purpose for your life and accomplish His will. A strong life is what God wants. And so without the storms, they're not going to be in this strong life. And you can look back over the years at uh, people who've been great saints of God and much written about them. They went through turmoil, heartache, brokenness, you name it, they went. A good example is Oswald Chambers. For example, he only lived to be 40, about 42 years of age. Many of you don't know who he is. He wrote a little uh, um, devotional book called, uh, how many of you know what it is? My utmost for his highest. Now, the title in itself says a lot. He died at an early age. But look what that little book has meant. I've read it for years and years. And I've read it since I've been in college. And it's not how long you live. It's what you do with your life. So what did his wife do? She took all of that and sort of uh, arranged it. And put it, she's the one who put the book together. And those two people that most people will ever know have used that, God has used that book to transform so many people's lives and point us to God. God has a purpose for your life. You need to find out what it is and give Him your life and ask Him to build strength into your life so that whatever years you have left, you don't want to waste them. God means, listen, God means for you to be fruitful all your life, strong, and you can be. And strong faith, of course, is one of the characteristics of a strong life. And what builds faith? Tough times, difficult times. And so a strong life's been tested and tried. And you come to somebody who said, they've been born, as we say, with a silver spoon in their mouth. They've always had everything they wanted, and everything went their way. You know what? I wouldn't swap trials and tribulations and heartaches for that kind of life for anything in the world, because you know what? They've missed it. They've missed it. So the next time you get to complaining about something, remember, this is a lesson God has. He's got a lesson in every single trial, heartache, burden, loss we have. He has a lesson. Wise men and women seek to know what their lesson is. People who are not worrying about their foundation and don't care about it, they just go on and complain and moan and groan, get on some drugs and so forth to help them get through it, and miss wonderful opportunities in life. Then, of course, a person with a strong life has, has courage. they got courage. You have to have courage to go through some difficulties and hardships. Remember what God said to Joshua? He said, Be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you, because I'm putting you in charge of two million of these Hebrews, and you, you remember that they rebelled against you, and they rebelled against Him. They're going to stone you to death, and they've been a problem to Moses all of his life. You're going to be in charge. Whew. What kind of a test was that? But you know, you read the book of Joshua, God's blessing him all the way through the book. All the way through the book, He's blessing him. He made one error up close to Ai after he, did, after he defeated the folks in uh, Jericho, and uh, he listened to somebody else instead of God, and they got wiped out. But from then on, he listened to God, and you can see how God worked in his life. He was a man of courage. Listen, courage isn't something somebody can give you. Courage is something that you grow in your life by trusting God and watching Him work and answer your petition. Then I think a person with a strong, who has a strong life uh, is optimistic. I mean, you're looking for the best. Why not? When I say to people, look your best, do your best, be your best. That's an optimistic viewpoint, but it's also a godly viewpoint. If you, you represent Jesus, you ought to look your best. Uh, you, you represent Him, you ought to do your best. Uh, you represent Him, you ought to be your best. Why not? Listen, we represent Him. He's the living God. We're His messengers. Every one of us is a messenger of God on this earth. 
And a person with a strong life is going to be optimistic and not down in the dumps. You show me somebody who's always complaining about something, and here's what's going to happen. Things are getting tough. Oh, God, I don't know what to do. I'm afraid of what's going to happen. The government's done this, and the government's going to do that. Just look to God and forget the government. I mean, God is the one who manages our life and no one else. And so you've got to be optimistic. And then here's something else that builds a strong life. Develop friendships. Listen, develop friendships with people who will enrich your life. There's something awesome about good friends, good friends of character who themselves have a strong life. Uh, some people in your life that, that you enjoy being with, that listen, just being with you and just being with them enriches you. You say, well, how do you mean enrich? You mean money? No. But uh, you laugh, uh, you love each other, uh, you kid each other, uh, you help each other. In other words, that each other business is awesome. Then, of course, expressing love and care for other people. If, if you can't express love and care for other people, you're not strong. If you can't love, you're not strong. Love is one of the basic, listen, what, listen, when, when Paul describes the fruit of the Holy Spirit, where does he start? Love, joy, peace, love. Loving somebody else, you, you're giving yourself away to someone else. You may give them things, or you may, you may give them yourself. In other words, but most of all, loving someone is making yourself available to them, cheering them up, encouraging them. A person who really loves is an encourager. A person who really loves is a person who makes a difference to the people around them. So ask yourself this question. The people who know you, do they think of you as a person who loves or a person who complains all the time? How many of you love being around a complainer? None of us. People who are just complaining about everything. It doesn't mean it's what happens. They, they find something to complain about. Godly people, strong people find something good. Something good, not something to complain about all the time. Loving is very important. Then, of course, a person uh, who has a strong life, they love, listen, they love, they live, and they serve God out of their spiritual gifts. Now, a spiritual gift is a gift of service or a gift of uh, giving, a gift of exhortation. They're all the seven major gifts in the book of Romans. So in the first service, I said, uh, I asked how many of you uh, know what your spiritual gift is, and some of them did, some didn't. It, it will just it give you joy to learn what your gift is, because once you begin to operate out of your gift, a lot of things that are pain to you now won't be pain anymore. In fact, you just say, oh, is that the way that is? And so... Once a person learns their spiritual gift, then they become strong. You, you work out of a whole different resource. A spiritual gift is a gift from God that enables you in a particular area of your life to do exceptionally well. And so when you're trying to do something you don't have a gift for, it's difficult. But I'm simply saying, when you have that gift, there's a sense of inner strength. We all have one or more. That inner strength does something to you for the inside and you'll be able to do better whatever you do. Then, of course, quick to forgive. A strong person is quick to forgive. You want to you wanna hinder yourself. You hold a grudge. You be unforgiving. And you say, well, what's that got to do with a strong life? I'll tell you what it has to do. A person who has an unforgiving spirit, it will affect you. Ultimately, it will affect your very physical body. If you have an unforgiving spirit, you hold grudges, or you have a sense of hate. Uh, those attitudes, uh, attitudes that affect the person, because you see, whatever affects your emotions affects your body, because you can't separate spirit and emotions and physical body. It all goes together. And it isn't just a spiritual thing. It's a spiritual thing uh, to act that way, but it becomes a physical thing. What you think and how you feel makes all the difference in the world. And a strong person is careful about how they relate to people. And so you would be quick to forgive. Let me ask you a question. What profit is there, what profit is there in a person's life when they hold a grudge, they're not forgiving, they build hatred in their life, animosity, they just hold it there. What advantage to you is that? Not one. What disadvantage is there to you? Many. Messes up your relationship to God. You say, you mean to tell me if my relationship to somebody else is not right, my relationship to God's not right, it's exactly right. And here's what happens. When you hold those attitudes in you, 
It not only hinders your relationship to the Lord, it hinders every aspect of your walk with Him, and it, it, it's going to affect your body. People who have that attitude, after a while, you know where it shows first? Right here. You start watching them. It shows there. It's already been working on the inside. But that's where it shows first. God intends for us to be godly and to walk before Him in a holy fashion. He created us that way. And you know what? It doesn't make any difference if a million people tell you it's not right. Just let them say it. The truth is, that's what the Word of God teaches. If you'll think about a God who is holy and loving and forgiving, and you say, well, sometimes I have that problem. I can remember the time when in my life I dealt with that once and for all and knew how to deal with it. Something had happened to me that hurt me, and so I was just sort of saying, well, Lord, you know, you know all that stuff you tell him, he doesn't listen to it. <laughs> and so it's like the Lord said to me, remember the cross? I thought, yes. How many times have I forgiven you? Yes. Have I held anything against you? No. Do you, what right do you have to hold anything against anyone when I have forgiven you of everything you have ever done, and I have even beforehand forgiven you of all you'll ever do? That cured me. It should cure everybody. If you, if you have those kind of feelings towards somebody else, just look at the cross. His outstretched arms and His shed blood took care of all of our sin, all of our mistakes, all of our heartaches, and all of our burdens. Strong life is very, very forgiving, quick to forgive. And then, of course, there's inner peace. A person has a strong life is going to have inner peace. Why? Your relationship with God is right. Relationship with others is right. Difficulties, hardship, pain comes th through into your life. What happens? In spite of all that, there's a peace. And I can remember this. You know, some things you can remember you'll never forget. I can remember when I heard the worst news I could ever hear as a pastor. Worst. And I got the phone call, and when I finished, I put the phone down. I had this overwhelming sense of awesome peace. And I remember saying, God, you've carried me through all these other storms. You'll take me through this one. Because... Because God is faithful, He will keep His Word, no matter what we do. And it's all of these things that build strength into our life, that so when the torrential storms come, we don't waver, we don't give up, we don't quit. And then, of course, um, the wise use of money. And that is, if you have a, if you, if you have a strong life, and if, if you'll think about it for a moment, Money drives most people. And look at what, in, in other words, what happens in America? It's, it's what is, what's happening on the stock market, what's happening here, what's happening to this corporation, that one. What's happening to money? How much money do people have? Well, it's a real simple way, and that is we save some, we give some, we spend some. And in the giving, we tie their income and trust God to do exactly what He says. And I can tell you, I've been a Christian for 68 years. I've more than tithed all 68 years. I've been blessed over and over and over and over and over again. And He couldn't even tell, tell you why, but I can tell you this. Here's what happens. When you obey God, you can't even tell why He blesses you. You, you, you can't predict what God's going to do. You just trust Him and see what happens. And a strong life isn't worried about money. Somebody says, but I just, I just have enough to make ends meet. Well, I've been there too. And you know what? My ends got met. Why? Because God's not going to come up short. He's going to do exactly what He says. Given that shall be given to you. How? Good measure, pressed down, shaken together. It's running over the top. That's what He says. Not what we deserve, but what He desires to give us. A strong life knows how to handle money. And a weak life oftentimes does not. A person can know how to handle money and still have a weak life. But if a person, has a, if a person is a strong life, they can know how to handle their money. And then, of course, 
listen to this, belonging to, belonging to a Bible teaching church. Now, I wouldn't tell anybody else where to go to church, but I can say this. If you're going to live a Christian life, you need to know what a Christian life's all about. If you're going to live a godly life and follow the Lord Jesus Christ, you need to be taught. We, listen, God's continually teaching me. I study all week long. I'm not looking for sermons. I'm looking and asking God to speak to my heart. Teach me something new. Work in my life. If you go to a church and sit there 20 or 30 minutes or an hour, and nobody opens the Bible, you're in the wrong church. You may not like that, but let me ask you a question. Why go spend an hour in, in, in a church and the Word of God is ignored. That's what church is all about. Church is about worshiping Him. How do I know who I'm worshiping with from the Word of God? Very important that you belong to a church where they teach the Word of God so that you can grow in your life and you can be strong and you can be, you can be fruitful for the kingdom of God. I will not tell you what to do about your church. I'm just asking you, why would you spend an hour in a church where the gospel is not preached? And the very qualities and characteristics uh, of Almighty God are never talked about. Jesus is totally ignored. What's that all about? I wouldn't go to a church like that. I wouldn't go to a church that didn't teach the Word of God. Because this is what, this is our time to worship Him. And what, what helps me worship Him is knowing the truth about Him. Where do I learn that? I learn it from reading myself, and I also learn it from those who've gone before me, who are also teach me the truths that they've learned. Very important if you're going to be a strong person that you have a source from which you're strengthened continuously. Then, of course, a strong person works to build a strong family. If you have a strong life, you want your children to be strong. You want them to know early in life what the Christian life is all about. And you want, them, you want to live the kind of life before them. They don't have to ask what's a Christian life like. They can say, my daddy or my mother, is a wonderful Christian. Building a strong family. We had a whole sermon on that, so I won't repeat that. And then, a servant spirit. A person who has a strength within you that's from God that makes you want to serve others. You want to help others. You want to do something for somebody else. If it's all coming your way, it's not very fruitful. It's when you're not able to give ourselves away to other people. So a strong life is a giving life. Not just money. A strong life is giving of ourselves to somebody else. Let me ask you this. How many of us have been helped in our life by other people? Every single one of us. We've all been helped by somebody else. And God intends for us to do the same for other people. Then, of course, to be goal-oriented. That is, you have goals in life. Somebody said to me one time, uh, how can you, how can you uh, be, trust God and still have goals? Well, Jesus had goals. He says, I must needs go through Samaria. And uh, he knew that his ultimate goal was the cross. And so God has goals for all of us. In other words, if, you, if there's a purpose for your living, there are goals in that purpose, things that he wants you to accomplish. And oftentimes a person won't, they won't set a goal in their life because they think, well, that's too high. God would never do that for me. So they get down here. No. Listen, is God weak? No. God's great. He's powerful. He's omniscient. We should set godly goals, godly goals for our life that look, look like it's something we can't do. But God will help you reach it if you're willing to walk the pathway of obedience and faith and an optimistic spirit, trusting Him in everything you do. Then, of course, to be confident. To be confident means, doesn't mean to be cocky doesn't mean to be proud and egotistical. It means, listen, that you have a self-assurance that is based on your relationship to God, that whatever He calls you to do, you can do it. Wherever He calls you to go, you can go. Where I think about how many missionaries have gone to many, many countries in the world, laid down their lives preaching and teaching the gospel, confident that God had sent them, and therefore they could weather the storms, whatever it might be. Every single one of us has a degree of confidence because when you walk out in the morning, put the key in your car to turn it on, you're confident that it's going to turn on, your engine's going to turn on, you're going to get to work. You drive an expressway, most people around you are doing at least 80 or 85. You have a sense of confidence, I'm not sure what it's built on, confidence <laughs> that, you, that you're going to get to work. We have confidence about many things. Listen, oftentimes 
we have less confidence in holy God than we have in things that we can't do anything about. Why wouldn't you be a confident person? Why wouldn't you be assured? God is your heavenly Father. Jesus is your Savior. The Holy Spirit is your motivator, and He's your energizer. And in other words, why shouldn't we be confident? A strong person is. And then I would mention uh, two last things. First of all, one of them is to be fruitful. If you're a strong person, you're going to be fruitful. Your life's going to be fruitful. Somebody's going to see you and think, you know what? That's the kind of person I want to be. That's what I want in my life. And all of us have met people like that. And I can remember uh, the two pastors, the first one I ever met, that I'd never heard in the preaching like he preached. And uh, I was in, in Texas when I heard him. And I remember sitting there thinking, God, I knew somebody could preach like that, and tonight I'm hearing him. It absolutely transformed me. Gave me, gave me all sorts of confidence and assurance and, and uh, wanting to be fruitful in my life. The other man, this first time I ever heard him, I thought, here's the second man who's really stirred me. I've watched the Spirit of God work in him. I thought, Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you. I've heard the second man that motivated me to want to give my best no matter what. Study the Word of God. Be true to the Word of God. So if you think about it, you're either going to bear good fruit or bad fruit. And you know what? Somebody says, well, who determines that? <laughs> Nobody but us. We're the ones who determine that. And so a strong life is fruit-bearing. And listen, in character, conduct, and conversation, they've got to be strong. The last thing I would say is simply this, and that is uh, this kind of life we're talking about will impact the lives of others. You're going to have an influence on other people. A strong life always impacts other people. So I would encourage you to, whether you listened or whether you were sitting here, to take this list and you'll say, well, does all this apply to me? Well, I figured it's certainly out of every one of them applied to me. I want, I want every single one of those things in my life. When I, for example, want to remember something, or when I want to, uh, when I want to go, when I want to accomplish certain things, I write them down. I put them beside my bed. I put them on my study. In other words, I go over them and over them and over them because I don't want to lose them. If you just put this, you put this in your Bible. So, oh, I'm gonna keep this really close in my Bible. No, 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 no. The idea is get it off the paper and get it in your heart and in your life. If you mean business, if you keep it somewhere close that you can keep reading them and reading them and you think, God, what's missing in my life? And the Lord shows you, well, first of all, uh, you're not being obedient to me. Or first of all, uh, you're not spending time in prayer. In other words, if you, want a, if you want a strong life, and if I should ask you, how many of you want a weak life? Nobody is going to want a weak life. And I've just shared with you the things that make for a strong life. And I pray God will entrench them into your heart and into your daily activities of your life. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you this morning that you're so good to us, so gracious and kind. And even in our best efforts, Father, we falter. You always then pick us up, keep us moving, and to grow us like yourself. You said you predestined us to be conformed to your image. I pray that you'll sink these truths into every life and that each person would be wise enough to look at themselves in the light of what is a strong life and make a decision to give you their best. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus Christ is the foundation of a strong life. Live for God and you'll find peace and blessing. Visit InTouch.org to discover the strength God provides in even the most trying times. There you can find today's message, A Strong Life, along with a library of free and inspiring messages from Dr. Stanley, sermon notes, and other resources to make your life strong. Download the InTouch app to take the teaching of Dr. Stanley on the go or follow us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Where did you grow up? Um, oh. <laughs> well, this is unbelievable. <laughs> did you make me as a kid? <laughs> Go to the park.
park? <gasps> Maybe we'll go to the park today. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Be careful, hold on. The Spirit-filled life is a life lived through us by the Holy Spirit, and the goal is to demonstrate and to express the character of Jesus Christ. An intimate look into the ministry of Dr. Stanley, The Spirit-Filled Life, a new edition of one of his classic books. This biblical perspective on the work of the Holy Spirit can deepen your intimacy with God. Life Principles to Live By, Dr. Charles Stanley's exploration of the 30 foundational truths that continue to guide his life and ministry. Order a box set on CD or DVD at intouch.org. Well, um, Dad, you just finished up this fantastic three-part series called Strong. And you talked about um, strong churches, strong families, and then just becoming strong personally. So what I want us to do, I thought would be fun, is to take the um, subject matter from that great series and ask the question, how does personal prayer interact or, or interface with those three topics? And before we jump into the specifics, though, um, I thought we should just talk about prayer in general. Now, as a pastor, and I don't, I don't know if you hear this, I bet you do, the, the thing I hear most from people about prayer is, Andy, um, I just don't think prayer works. It just doesn't work. And then people tell a story about something they prayed for and it didn't work. So before we jump into the specifics, why do you think people think prayer doesn't work? And what do you think, I guess in general, is the, even the purpose of prayer to begin with? Well, the purpose of prayer, most people don't even think about. And that is the purpose of prayer is God wants us to develop an intimate, personal relationship with Him. He said He predestined us to be conformed to the likeness of His Son. And His Son and He, he had this awesome relationship. And so that's what God is looking for. And the reason it doesn't work, number one, a lot of those people who are saying they're praying are not even saved. Secondly, people who are saved have sin in their life. And thirdly, uh, many people are just praying for selfish things. Yeah. They're not praying for other people. They're not asking for the will of God to be done. It's all about me, myself, and I, and God is not interested in that. Yeah, I, th I think that's true. In fact, when I listen to people pray, even Christians, if I'm in a small group and we have prayer requests, you know, the prayer requests are usually pretty self-centered, or if they're not self-centered, they're somehow related to being self-centered because it's pray for my son or my daughter or my aunt. Somehow it, right. gets, it gets back to me, and then God doesn't do exactly what we want God to do, and we think something's wrong with God. They sort of make God an errand boy. Or Santa Claus. Yeah, yeah. and <laughs> so when I get in trouble, Lord, here's where I am. I need some help. I need this. I need that. That's not even what prayer is all about. So if you had to summarize it, and you, you have, it, you know, if somebody were to say, so tell me, why should I pray? Just give me one good reason to pray. If I don't see the results I'm getting, why should I continue to pray? Because it's the will of God that you pray. And Paul put it this way. He said, pray without ceasing. It's that development of a relationship. And so if a person never prays, you have no relationship to God. And if you're praying with only selfish motives, that's no relationship. He, he wants intimacy with us. And I think until a person realizes that, their prayer life is just going to be empty. Now, when you say prayer life, I'm thinking for many um, listeners and viewers, prayer life, um, they've never heard, they know what prayer is, they know what life is, they've never heard prayer life. And growing up, um, one of my earliest memories, we've talked about this, one of my earliest memories was when we lived in Miami and you built a cinder block um, shed in our backyard for tools and a lawnmower. But then you took part of that, you put a dividing wall in and you had your study out there. And mom would send me out there to get you for dinner when dinner was ready and I'd run out there, 
burst into the door and you would be stretched out on your face praying. And I couldn't hear what you were saying, but I could hear that you were saying something. In my whole life, I remember wherever we lived, you always had a place to pray. And I think that's associated with your prayer life. So talk about why you had a place and then answer this question. Do you think everybody should have a place or was that something that's just <laughs> kind of something you did because of your personality? Well, you know, I grew up um, with my mom teaching me to pray, to pray, not necessarily how. And then when I got my first paper route, I prayed all the way around the paper route every morning. Out and loud or just? Yeah, out loud because nobody on the streets at 5 o'clock in the morning, 5.30 in the morning, so I didn't care whether they heard me or not. And so I did it because I felt the need. Mm -hmm. And I grew up in a situation, which you're aware of, that um, I needed God. I, I didn't very, do very well in school to begin with. And so I grew up with this sense of need of Him. And the wonderful thing about it is it taught me uh, to begin my days every day talking to Him, and I still do. Mm. And so when I look back over those times and then I think about times since then, in every study I've ever had, I've always had a place to pray, a, a prayer room. And um, it, has, it, it just became a way of life for me that you begin the day with the Lord. And, and when I didn't, for example, at home, a, a place in my study, I had a place to pray. And one of the reasons I think you need a place is I discovered this sort of as a result of doing it. And that is when I would get to the place I was going to pray, it's like I didn't have to get ready. Wow. In other words, I'd been there so often for the very same thing of talking to the Lord. When I got there, I didn't have to say, well, forget this and that and the other. It's like I was ready. Mm -hmm. And the second thing, and people will think this is foolish, but it doesn't make any difference what they think about it. There are times when I pray, I want to cover up my head. And there are times when I want to pray, I want to be in a dark room. I don't want any distractions. And I think there's something about having a place that you and God meet. And that place is very precious and very special. It's where you open your heart. It's where you claim your promises. It's where you deal with trials and heartaches and burdens in your life that uh, you can't even share with anybody else. Mm. It becomes like an altar to you. It's like a place, of, a place of sacrifice. You and the Father meet and you share your heart. And uh, I, pr I pray out loud most of the time and somebody says, well, you don't have to pray out loud. No, I don't. But I do because what I discovered I'm not distracted if I'm praying out loud. If I'm just sitting here mumbling, then I may start thinking about something else. But if I'm talking to the Lord and I'm talking out loud and unloading my heart to Him and believing that He's listening to me, and so often I discovered this and having that place. If I'd come in in the afternoon after a pretty tough day, or even if it wasn't a tough day, and I'd lie down and... Um, uh, on my face. That's the way I pray. And people say, well, you don't have to kneel. No, you don't. But to me, I reverence God as a holy God. Mm -hmm. And uh, I feel like that's what I need to do personally. But I'd lie and sometimes I'd go to sleep. And many times While I you're did. praying. Yeah, that's right. I bet no one listening today has ever had that happen to them before. So this is a... <laughs> well, <laughs> I'd go to sleep. And here's the interesting thing. When I'd wake up, I'd be so alert. And it's like God allowed me to go to sleep to quieten my spirit and to just flush out of me all the things that I'd been thinking about and things I may have been concerned about. So that time of quietness is a time of God just, just cleaning me out and, and just making it possible for me to focus on Him. So you've always had a place. I've always had a place. And so tell us about your places. And the reason I ask is because when I talk, this is one of the well, this is one of the greatest things you taught me because I've always had a place and I've always had a place to pray because I grew up seeing that. And for me, um, and respond to this, is, if this sounds, if this is what you're talking about. When I was in college, I would go to, I went to Georgia State, I would get there early and I found a hallway. It was a stairwell that was an emergency stairwell if the elevators or escalators weren't working. And I got there early and I sat on the same step at the, on the same floor inside the same door every single morning before class at Georgia State University on the days that I had class. And that was my place at school. And the only thing I ever did there, because it's the only time I ever went to that hallway, I would sit there and to your point, it's like I was immediately ready to begin my right. devotional life. Then at home, I had a, a different 
place. But I tell people all the time, it doesn't have to be a prayer room. It doesn't have to be a prayer closet. It could be a chair. And the only time you ever sit in that chair in a guest room is when you're going to have your devotional life. Is that what you're talking about? Absolutely. You know, and when I was growing up also, we had a very small house and, and um, I found a place in the church, which is two blocks away, downstairs in the basement, way back, had to go through three doors to get to this little room. But I, in the afternoon after I delivered newspapers, I would go in there and just unload my heart to the Lord and ask for direction for my life. I could pray as loud as I wanted to. And uh, nobody is, <laughs> and I wasn't praying for anybody else, but uh, somehow when I pray out loud, I'm not distracted and my mind doesn't wander. But that place, is very precious. And I think everybody needs a place. I really I do. And I, I have so many pastor friends, and when I talk about these things, they'll ask me about my devotional life, and they're always, they always seem to be shocked that I have a place. And I, I just assume, well, doesn't everybody have a place? But it's because I grew up, that, that was just an assumption. So I don't think it's a personality thing. I really do think people need a place, and I think we need to pray out loud, not because God can't hear our prayers, but you're exactly right. People say, well, my mind wanders when I pray. And I always say exactly what you, what you inferred. I say, that's because you don't pray out loud. You have thinking prayers. And so all you need is a new thought to come along. But if you pray out loud and there's no one around, no one's going to interrupt you. You know, there are a lot of mental interruptions. If you're praying out loud, it's, it's a point of focus. And you know, the second thing about praying out loud, sometimes I've been praying and I will, I will be talking to the Lord about something particularly. And when I hear myself say it, I think, oh, yes, Lord. Do you ever write things down while you're praying? Absolutely. That's why I keep a notepad <laughs> over this. Now, talk about, I know we're getting off the subject a little bit, but that's, that I do as well. And that's an interesting thing. So why, why would you stop praying to write something down? Because I don't want to forget it. In other words, if God said it, I do not want to forget it. And oftentimes, uh, and, and I discovered this also, if I'm studying and I'm tired, I get in the prayer room, go fast asleep. And not meaning to, but I do. When I wake up, I'm so, re I'm so refreshed. It's like God's cleared out everything. Now He can speak. Yep. And I discovered that, uh, I, first of all, I thought, well, I'm not very spiritual. I go to sleep, I'm supposed to be praying. No, it's God's time of quieting our spirit so I can really hear what he has to now, say. And I think that encourages a lot of people because I think everyone who's been a Christian for very long is frustrated by how easily they get distracted and how oftentimes they fall asleep when they're praying. But you're saying that God can use that if we don't wake up and then get busy again and, and miss that opportunity. You wake up to hear him, to yep. listen carefully. And all of this assumes that you have carved out time for this. Now, in other words, this isn't prayer while you're driving. This isn't I have five minutes. This is throughout your life, and I guess the paper route helped establish that, you've set aside time, and for you, it's normally mornings, right? Right. And you know, I, I, I started in the mornings because at that point in my life, I was 13 years old, um, and I was out there in all these streets and so forth and where I lived, and I was afraid. Mm -hmm. So I'd get up, and before I got out of the bed, I started praying. And you know, this is a habit I've had over these years. Before I get out of the bed, I ask God to give me wisdom for the day, and direction and make me sensitive to His presence. And I want to be obedient to you, Lord, today, whatever that might be. Before you get up. Before I get out of the bed, because I, I love lying there in the quietness and the darkness. And somebody says, why would, you, why would you cover up your head? Cover up my head because I don't want any distractions. Mm. And so if I don't see anything, and I don't hear anything, it's just God and me, and I love that. Wow. And there's a lot of Old Testament imagery there. There's a lot of that kind of reverence for isolation, um, there's a lot of Jewish tradition around that very idea, even things that aren't in the Old Testament where that was a part of the separation. It almost represented the private tabernacle going into the Holy of Holies. This is my quiet yeah, place. Yeah, that's my Holy of Holies. Yeah. That's right. Okay, so let's uh, change subject a little bit. Um, this series that you did, Strong, it, it's, it's fantastic. You took these three topics, church, family, and personal life. And so let's talk a little bit about praying for the church. Now, I would guess most Christians never pray for their church. They might pray for their pastor, but in terms of just praying for their local church, and I think you and I would agree that if there's an institution or organization anywhere in the world that needs prayer, um, not because things are bad, but because of, you know, the church is really the epicenter of the activity of God on the earth. You know, Jesus said, I'm going to build my church. That's the only thing he said he was going to build. 
and uh, he's been building it for 2,000 years. So if you, if you could say to every Christian in our country, I want you to pray for your local church, and here's what I want you to pray, what would you want them to pray as you think about strong local churches? I would pray, first of all, that my church would have a vision for their purpose to reach people for Christ and meet their needs. Secondly, I'd pray for unity of spirit, mm -hmm. that what we do, we do it together, we head in one direction. And three, I would pray for the spirit of obedience to permeate that church. And four, I would pray for an awareness of the dependence upon the Holy Spirit to accomplish all the work that God has set for that church. So in a sense, anybody who listened to that message could actually take those points and you could, each one of those could be what you pray for your local church, even right. if you pick three or four. I think, I can't remember exactly, I think it was point number nine, you talked about unity. And um, I wanna read this passage from John 17 and let you comment on this because in John 17, as you know, and most of your audience knows, this was Jesus' high priestly prayer. And it's so fascinating because he prays for his disciples and then he prays for those who will believe based upon their testimony, which is us. So in, a, in right. essence, he's praying for us in the future and for the future church. And I just think this is such an interesting comment. Jesus is uh, John 17, 20. Jesus says, my prayer is not for them alone, talking about his current day disciples. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that. And then in the next verse, he tells us what they pray. And sometimes when I preach this passage, I say to people, okay, now we're about to find out what Jesus prayed for us. What do you think it was? And I let people guess. What do you think he's going to pray? He could pray anything for us. And he prayed the very thing that you just mentioned, that all of them may be one father, just as you and I are in me and I'm in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me, that the reason that people will take the church seriously is the unity they see in the church. And so I do think it's so important that we, all of us pray for our churches, that there would be unity, not necessarily around style or the way that we do things, that, but outsiders would look at us. So when you think about praying for unity in the church, again, give us one, you know, if you forget everything else I say, you're going to pray for your local church. What should we pray around that? I would pray that the Spirit of God would speak to the hearts of the people in the church, that we would have a oneness of mind and heart about who we are, where we're headed, what we're trying to accomplish, and our total dependence upon the Lord Himself. And I think one of the reasons uh, Jesus said that is because if there's no unity, then what's our message to the world? Yep. We don't have a message. If there's disunity, you think about churches that have splits and the pastor gets run off or he leaves or whatever, and there's disunity, there's heartache, there's disappointment, there's accusations, there's anger, all kind of things. And, I, and Jesus, of course, foresaw all of that. And when he prayed that prayer, he was indicating to us how extremely important the spirit of unity is for the effectiveness of the, of the body of Christ. And isn't it interesting? I mean, it's 2,000 years ago. There isn't even a church yet. And he knew the number one thing the church would struggle with was unity. I mean, it's really fantastic because we know churches rarely split over theology. That would sort of be a breath of fresh air. Right. They split <laughs> over the disunity among people over the some of the dumbest things we've. And, we've and look at that. the Apostle Paul. He wrote all yeah. those letters, but it was conflict everywhere he went. Disunity, you got Pharisees, Sadducees, you know those who love the law, and, and it was just total confusion. In fact, I think sometimes. I, I certainly would not have wanted to be the pastor of the Corinthian church. There was nothing but conflict and disorder and sin and disobedience. And I think, what an awesome sense of commitment Paul had because disunity was one of the biggest problems he faced. Yep. And it's the very thing Jesus prayed for. Right. Okay, the second thing you talked about in the Strong series was family. And uh, in the message, you said this, a strong family is one in which the members of the family have a love and devotion to one another. A strong family is one where members of the family have a strong love and devotion for one another. So with that in mind, how should we pray um, for our families and I think just the family in general? How, how, would you, how would you do that? Well, I can tell you how I prayed for my family and you're a part of that. I prayed, number one, that the spirit of obedience would be transferred uh, from my life to your life and to Becky's life and to Annie's life. I prayed that you would f discover the will of God for your life. I prayed that you would walk obediently before Him. I prayed that you would do your best to whatever God called you to do. Mm -hmm. And um, 
People would ask me oftentimes, well, did you pray for Andy to go in the ministry? I said, no. I never suggested it. I just said, my desire for you is that you be obedient to God, whatever that requires of you. And I pray uh, that for the family. Then I also think we have to pray for their protection and a sense of discernment to know what is right and what is wrong, and what is good and what is best and what's the will of the Father, and that there be a sense of unity within the family. That's not always the case, but I think that's a, 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 a vital part of what we pray for the family. And to pray that we would have a testimony. As a family. Yeah, have a testimony. And I think that's very important today because look at most families today, they're all broken up. Mm -hmm. They have no concept whatsoever of a real sense of love and devotion to each other. When we uh, had our first child and Andrew was in a car seat, I remember we were driving to um, Hilton Head, South Carolina, and I said to Sandra, I said, and I'm not really a, much of a goal setter. You're an extraordinary goal setter and help me with that, but I've, that's just not a strength for me. But I said, I feel like we need to have a family goal or two and that we would then pray toward this goal. If we can kind of set, what's the North Star for our family? What's the, the place we want to be someday? And this is 20, over 20 years ago. And um, we landed on this idea, and it's, it's, it goes right to this unity idea. We decided that the, the finish line or the um, bullseye on the target for us as a family would be that when our kids are old enough not to have to be with us, that they would want to be with us. Mm, that when they good. had the choice to be wherever they wanted to be and go wherever they wanted to go, that when they could, there would be a desire, not, oh, it's Christmas, we have to go, it's Thanksgiving, we have to go, but they would lean, they would want to be with us. And setting that as a goal and praying for that and praying with them about that, here we are 20 years later, and uh, recently we were all five together, and um, we were walking around and, and finished up dinner, and. I just whispered to Sandra, I said, it worked. I said, look, our kids, you know, they're 21, 19, and uh, about 21, 19, and 17, um, you know, they're at a stage where they can get in their cars, go over too off in college, and they enjoy being together. And I really do think it was establishing that up front, but then, to your point, not only defining what is a strong family, but praying to that end, because as you know, when you pray to an end, it shapes your behavior. And so I feel like we're at a stage where we are uh, reaping the benefits of really prayers in that very direction. Well, you remember growing up, oftentimes when we had an issue, we had a table about yep. this size, and we'd all get around We the, had a place. Right. We'd all get around the table and pray about whether it's buying a car or a house or whatever it moving. might be. We prayed right. about moving. Right. And I remember, um, I think one of the important things is to involve the children in major decisions. and. When I was thinking about leaving Bartow and coming to First Baptist Atlanta, I decided one of the things I was concerned about is uh, how you'd respond to that. We lived in Bartow, and you know, two blocks down the street yep. was a big lake, and we could fish and do all these things. And so I said, let's go for a bike ride, which we did pretty often. And I remember the question I asked you. I said, Andy, what would you think about if I told you uh, I was thinking about leaving uh, Bartow and moving to a big city, uh, Atlanta, Georgia. I will never forget what you said. You said, I can quote it accurately. Well, whenever God has spoken before and we have obeyed Him, He's always blessed us, wow. period. I said that? That's exactly what you said. And so I said, thank you, Jesus. I was and in fifth grade. Yeah, I said, thank you, Jesus. That's all I needed to know. <laughs> well, see, that was God you, had us. You thought flesh and blood did not reveal that to you. You're only in the fifth grade. <laughs> <laughs> well, but you grew up uh, believing God and trusting Him and be believing that prayer mattered. And um, I think back, we prayed about everything. And going back and kind of connecting some of these dots, and you just brought this up because this was later in my notes. Um, we had a, you know, we talked about having a place of prayer individually, but we had a place of prayer as a family. Some people call it a family altar. You were great as a pastor about not over spiritualizing things, and I've tried to do that with my kids because as a pastor, people expect you to have a family altar. I don't really, really even know what that is, but we had a place. You said, let's pray, and we all knew we were going to go right over to that round coffee table and we were going to get on our knees and pray. And so as a father, um, we've, and Sandra and I have done the same thing. Ours is a little less formal. We call it stair prayer. And it's because we always gather on the stairs. We'd say, let's pray. We'd go to the stairs. We could kneel if we wanted to kneel or sit. 
and as the kids were older and you know we could all get on the stairs so over time we called it stair prayer and we still call it that the other night Allie and Sandra and I went over we said let's pray and we all just headed to the stairs so having a place even as a family can make a significant difference well and you are evidence of the fact that it's fruitful and that it works well Time will tell. <laughs> <laughs> I think okay. that by this point, I'm convinced. Yeah. All right, let's move to the third category. We talked about praying for the church and praying for our family. In the third part of the series, you talked about having a strong life. So when you think about, and you had so much helpful content, but when you think about if I'm going to pray for a strong life, um, what's central? What, what do you pray for specifically? What's, in some ways, the one thing? Well, my personal conviction is to pray, God, I want to be an obedient servant. So make me sensitive to what you're saying, um, correct anything in my heart or my life that would cause me to be disobedient in any way. So I think obedience is an issue. And if you'll think about it, you don't hear people talking about obedience. No. And so when I talk about being obedient to God, I'm sure a lot of folks think, well, what does that mean? It means you do what He says to do. And it means you find out in the Word uh, exactly what He says. And I think you can't separate effective praying from reading the Word of God. Because you, you can just get off in all kind of situations and circumstances uh, without God's Word. And this is what I, that's why I call the Bible the guidebook. This guides me in every single decision of life. There's nothing you can come up with. So you read the Word of God, here's what He says, and then you talk to Him about it. Well, God, what did you mean by this? And it's not having a Bible study. It's, it's looking in the guidebook to think, well, now, how am I to deal with this situation and circumstance? And my goal uh, for you all was that early in life that you could never remember when we started praying together. Mm. Or I can remember when you weren't, you didn't even have any idea hardly who I was. I'd get down beside your bed at night. I'd pray that the Lord would bless you and give you guidance. And God, that, uh, Lord, that you'll show Andy very early in life your will for his life. I prayed that before you ever understood what the will of God was about. And I prayed it when you did know what it was about. And I've always prayed it, that, that God would show you his will and that you would walk in it. And I say the same thing for Becky. And I think uh, if parents will just hone in on that one thing, Lord, show them your will and give them the wisdom and the courage to be obedient, that takes care of everything. Yep. And again, it's, it becomes directional. Kids hear their parents praying for them. And there are a lot of things you pick up just listening to your parents pray for you. In your message, and this, was, this took me by surprise. And, and at first I thought, I don't know, but then I thought, no, this is a big deal. You talked about maintaining an optimistic outlook. And I thought, in terms of having a strong life, that's really powerful. Clinically, that's been proven. Optimists just do better in life. They live longer. How is there a connection between your prayer life and your optimism? Absolutely. And here's the reason. Who am I talking to? I'm talking to all mighty God who has all power to do all things. Secondly, I'm talking to a God who loves me absolutely and unconditionally. I'm talking to a God who wants the best for me. I'm talking to a God who has promised in His Word to enable me to accomplish anything and everything He set out for me to accomplish. And so I think if a person's prayer life is affected, they're going to be optimistic. They're going to be excited. And uh, I wake up every morning excited. I do. And uh, even when I'm facing some trial or some particular burden, I can end up by thanking God, you've heard me. I know you're going to work in this, even as I did this morning, praying for somebody very special in my life and praying that the Spirit of God would give them wisdom and direction. And um, so, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a powerful thing. And I think one of the main things about prayer that uh, the Lord taught me, in fact, I was in uh, seminary the first year, uh, second year, and uh, my place to pray was over in the corner of the living room. Didn't have it, uh, a living room and a, a very small kitchen and one bedroom and a bath. And that was it. I was over in the corner. I'll never forget this. It's, and I was praying about school and the future and so forth. It's like the Lord said to me very clearly. And I don't know what I was praying about at that particular point. Um, but it's like he said to me, you must remember this. It's not you. It is me. It's, it, it's me in you. 
And, and secondly, he said to me very clearly, whatever you accomplish in life, you will accomplish on your knees, mm -hmm. not by your education, not by your intelligence, not by your gifts, but by, by on your knees. So that was God's signal to me. You operate on your knees in devotion to Him no matter what. Wow. And when I think of all the battles I've been through uh, in these uh, 80 years, it's worked. I mean, uh, uh, I am optimistic because I've seen God bring me through so many things that other people would have said, no, give them, quit, and walk away, or whatever it might be. Um, I don't know how you can pray effectively if you're not praying in faith. Mm -hmm. That is faith in God, that He will do what He says, He will be what He said He would be, and He will enable you no matter what. I, uh, <clears throat> I heard a um, clinical psychologist, he wasn't doing a spiritual talk, it was just an informational talk about behavior and they did um, broad studies about educated people, not so educated people, super bright people, not so bright people, who all went into a certain kind of sales, and they were trying to figure out what the common denominator was of the people who did well and those who didn't. And after, they looked at all kinds of different categories, and they determined at the end of the day, it was belief. That the person who believed they could, did, and the person that at some point along the way quit believing they could, didn't. And when I heard that, I thought it's so amazing that it's the central to Jesus' teaching, especially in the book of John, he comes back to over and over and over the importance of belief. And not simply belief in the promises of God, although that's extraordinarily important and central to us as Christians, but just the human characteristic of belief. And then when I saw that in your message, I thought that's a big part of, of who you are and what you've done. You have always you have believed that God would do what God has promised, but you've always believed anything is possible that it's just, I mean, you grew up telling me that. You can do anything you set your mind to, it's possible. And um, you're, you're an optimist. And I guess in spite of the way you were brought up, you had every reason to be a pessimist. But um, I just think it's powerful. And I, I was so glad that in the message, even though it seemed, you know, there wasn't a verse for optimism, you know, it, it's absolutely true. And there's certainly a spiritual component to that. Well, if you'll think about it, look at the God you serve. And if you're walking obediently before Him and listening to Him, how can you lose? Yeah. And I remember when uh, they were voting on me at the First Baptist Church Atlanta and, uh, and that big business meeting we had to see they keep me or fire me, whatever. And I'm sitting over in the, um, the wing. In the wing, and nobody knows that I'm there. And in the process, I had my Bible open and uh, I was uh, looking at this verse. And um, he says, no weapon formed against you will prosper. Mm. And I'm sitting over there reading that, and I'm listening to all these people saying all the things they want to say. It was all over. Uh, they voted for me to be the pastor. And um, I think there's something very important about praying uh, with Scripture. Because all I had that night was, was a pastor's Scripture. No weapon formed against you will prosper. Mm. And so I sat there, and I, I keep reading that, and I listened to all this stuff, and I keep reading that. And I was thinking this morning, I was talking to someone who was going through a very difficult time, and uh, they gave me a passage of Scripture and um, uh, of, of confidence of what God was going to do. Then I gave them this one back uh, because they were saying, I want to be sure I say the right thing. It's very important and how uh, strategic it was. I gave him this verse. I put my words in your mouth and have covered you with a shadow of my hand. Wow, that's Isaiah what? Isaiah 51, 16. In Isaiah fact, 51, 16. Read it, read it one more time. Okay. I put my words in your mouth and have covered you with a shadow of my hand. That's Imagine that. And I'll tell you what I did one, on occasion when uh, President Reagan was president and a group of us were meeting with him and, and uh, naturally you got to have your picture made and all that stuff. So you weren't allowed to give him anything, but he was on his getting ready to go to Russia the next week. I wrote that out on a very small piece of paper and I shook his hands and I said, Mr. President, God told me to give you this. And he took it. He took it? Yeah. And I found out later, he said to one of the persons who worked with him, that the most important thing that had happened in that meeting is a note that somebody handed him. Really? Yeah. So I thought that was very interesting. And 
I've never heard that story before. Yeah, well, I don't tell it because I don't want somebody to think, well, do you know President Reagan? Well, I, I think didn't... we should probably just give all of his credit, all of his success to that day when you handed him that note. That might have been the <laughs> defining moment in his, his uh, presidency. You think? Well, what happened to pull down the, the Berlin uh, Wall? There you I, go. Mean. <laughs> I know. Well, you think about walking away and he's thinking, oh, great, you know, I mean, people are always trying to give the president, I mean, people are always trying to give us stuff. Imagine the president. Right. And he gets in a quiet corner and he's about to hand it to somebody else or throw it away and he looks, sticks it in his pocket. And as you know, presidents really don't carry anything. They're, it's almost, they're too dignified. It's like a king. They, to carry something is almost work. So to think that he had that in his pocket, it may be the only thing he carried around for that day or in the days to come. So that was a pretty bold move. Because I have put my words in your mouth and have covered you with the shadow of my hand, which means he would tell him what to say and cover them. Wow. All right, well, we're wrapping up, and we've talked about prayer, the purpose of prayer, that most people need a place, and we need to pray out loud. And then we talked about praying through this grid of pray for your church, pray for unity, John 17, pray for, the, pray for um, your family, and pray for yourself personally, that you'd build on a solid foundation. Anything else you want to add to all of that or different subject or in summary to your audience before we wrap up? Yeah, I'd simply say this, that your life is going to be determined by your prayer life what you accomplish or what you fail to accomplish. Your prayer life, based on the truth of the Word of God, will determine your success or your failure, your relationship to Almighty God and to others, and whether you accomplish in life what you set out to accomplish. And most of all, it will determine the degree of intimacy you have with your Heavenly Father. Very, very important. Well, that was fantastic. Can't think of a better way to wrap that up. Thanks for having this conversation. I think everybody loves to peer a little bit deeper into your personal life. It makes it more personal for all of us, so thanks. And I love doing it with you. Andy. And I love you. Thank you.